Keith Galair, and welcome to the Loaf of Bread GA podcast, slicing into the GA of the past, present, and future. Join me, Jason Keelan, as we cut into the largest loaf of bread known to mankind. On this week's Slice 8, I have the chats with a legend of several codes. Whether footballing with her sister and teammates in Kilmehill, GA, and West Clare, kicking with the county, winning the Champions League with West Clare Waves, representing Ireland with the Irish Banshees, or kicking goals on the biggest stage down under with Adelaide Crows, this woman does it all. And to boot, a sister who has recently been voted as fullback on the Irish women's rugby team of the decade. It is, of course, Ailish Considine. But before we meet Ailish and have the chats, let's take our usual history trip through Ailish's parish of Kilmehill and County Clare and have a quick look at her current home in Adelaide. Bon Sultos. This week, we cut across country from the Royal County of Meath to the beauty of Ireland's wild Atlantic Way, and more specifically the stunning County Clare. Nestled down in the west, just off the N68, is the little village of Kilmel. The village is near the likes of Quilty, Kilkey, Kilrush and Trumpland, also known as Doombeg. The village was once part of the West Clare Gaeltacht until 1956, when it was deemed not to have enough native speakers. A local group continues to push for the development of the language and the Gaeltacht status in the area. The County of Clare is the place where Irish history evidence begins with the finding of a bare bone in 1903, suggesting that Ireland was occupied more than 2,000 years earlier than originally believed. In more recent times the county has been between the province of Connacht and Munster, with ownership through various disputes involving such names as Murroch O'Brien and Henry VIII. In 1660 the county was restored back to Munster, where it remains. The Banner County, as it is known, has long had an association with the plight of Catholic emancipation through Kerry native Daniel O'Connell in the 19th century. Indeed, when O'Connell was running against MP for Clare William Vesey Fitzgerald, his supporters marched behind him tennis to vote, all carrying various banners. Since then, the tradition in Clare of businesses having their own banners continues, keeping the county nickname alive. Clare offers a huge amount to visitors, the iconic Cliffs of Moher, Kilkey Town, La Hinch, Spanish Point, Bunratty Castle and Lupet are just some of the many spots of interest. Nestled in the county is the world famous area known as the Burren. This karst landscape is Ireland's smallest national park, but perhaps, in the view of many, the best. Other than the beauty of the limestone lands are the nearby villages of Listumvarna, Ballyvaughan and Kilfenora, the home village for the masterpiece that is Father Ted. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Indeed, take a trip to Killin' a Boy down the road and you will see the actual house of Ted Dougal Jack and Mrs Doyle. It's too difficult to mention all the names associated with the county. From writer Josephine Edna O'Brien to former President Patrick Hillary, musician Sharon Shannon, submarine inventor John Philip Holland and scientist Daniel Vaughan to name a few. But it would be remiss not to mention the GA links from founder Michael Cusack, a moonshore from Karen, to the legendary voice of Marty Morrissey. It's over the bar! Oh, holy Moses! To the never-ending list of household names such as Lochnan, Lohan, O'Connor, McMahon, Fitzgerald, Baker, Lynch, Daly, Kelly, Gilfoyle, Tuohy, to name but a few. But the little village of the Church of St. Michael, known as Kilmill, is not to be overlooked. 1912 Olympian Tomás O'Donoghue, Rugby legends Adele McMahon and Emer Considine, and Ailish herself, all hail from the area. In 1959, on the day of the opening of the park in Kilmehill, the club captured the Cusa Cup, defeating Kilrush in what was described as a tactically simple catch and kick football style. In 1980, the men's seniors won their one and only championship, led by captain Martin Murphy. It would be 1995 before success reached again, this time in the minor grade. In 2008, the ladies' intermediate team went all the way to All-Ireland victory with Ailish and Emer, scoring an incredible 16-37 between them in the campaign. In 2019, the senior ladies' team won their first ever title at the level. Ailish was player of the match in the final. Her career, much like that of her sister, has made the Considine name synonymous with success. Indeed, go back to the Clare Journal in 1900 and you will see the name Considine appear on the team sheet for the men's side. More than a century later, both ladies take on the challenges of rugby at home and AFL down under, but both are united in one thing, the GAA. From togging out in the rain at underage, 
Ailish has proven herself a worthy winner. From Kilmihill to Clare Senior Ladies, she soon found herself in 2018 lining out on the West Clare Waves AFL team in the European Champions League. In doing so, they were the first Irish club to compete at this level. Not only would they compete, they went on to lift the crown in Holland. Along the way, they defeated the likes of Wandsworth team in some London, a team boasting no fewer than a dozen Australians who were more than familiar with the oval ball. That didn't matter to Ailish and co. There was certainly a strong Kilmihill force driving behind them, with Ailish, Adele McMahon, Rosie Kern and coach Michael Kern. And so this led to where Ailish finds herself now, in Adelaide in Australia. While Ailish may be used to St Patrick's Day parades at home, she may now get used to the world's largest Christmas parade held in the city each year. But not a bad place to be if you like music. The city is widely known as Australia's live music city and was dedicated as a UNESCO city of music. In 2011 I went to Adelaide to visit relatives, travelling through the country and on to South America, hopping off the plane to be handed a ticket to the Oval to see the men play against the West Coast Eagles was one of the great sporting experiences I ever had, especially sitting in front of an 85 year old woman season ticket holder who screamed more abuse at a referee than any GA match I've ever been to. Despite being only a few years down under, Ailish has already proven herself with the Crows. In the grand final of 2019, she was on the scoreboard in a demolition of Carlton and has established herself as a key member of selection along with the likes of her partner Anna Ratchard. As the Crows motto says, we fly as one. While she may fly high with the Crows, Ailish always knows that her nesting began in the beautiful surroundings of Kilmahill in West Clare. So let's meet the one and only Kilmail legend herself, Ailish Considine. Hello. Well, Ailish, how are things? Not too bad, how are you? Ash, I'm all right, yeah. I said I'd give you the full the full rig out, I'd go kit and, and the yeah, whole. Yeah, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> seen all the crow's gear. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. I said I'd, uh, I said I'd get out. Now, I had to wear sleeves underneath because it's, uh, it's pissing rain and there's gale force wind here. So, uh, so oh, Jesus. I wasn't, I wasn't going short. It's to hear then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, <laughs> awake, awake half the night with the wind here. It's absolutely unbelievable. I, I haven't seen it Jesus. now in a while. So I was all out there. Yeah, it's it's pretty normal, to be honest. Life is pretty much same. That they yeah. they get worried when they get one or two cases and they go crazy here. But yeah. other than that, it's it's COVID-free and normal life. So yeah, oh, we're lucky too, here. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, a family out in Adelaide, right? I was out there in I think 20, 2011. I was out there. I hopped off the plane. I was handed a season ticket to the Oval and I went st- straight to a match. My suitcase Jeez. was taken off me. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was quite, quite an experience. Yeah. Do you? Uh, I was asked the the girl that I job share with at the moment. She's a a Murray originally from Mullock. She was asking, do you know any of the Murrays from Mullock? From Mullock, yeah. Um, PJ Murray, James, John Murray, James prob- Mar- probably related to. Yeah, um, maybe I wouldn't know of them. I might know them very well. I'd know, yeah. probably know of them. It's yeah. it's a small enough area now where West Clare. So yeah, it is. Yeah, that's not. Probably- like- Nice spot down there, all right. Um, yeah, it is in fairness. Yeah, the, the thing I start with uh, with everybody that I've had on and will have on was uh, who were the influences you had growing up down in Kilmihill or, or beyond <laughs> in the GAA? Yeah, um, I guess um, from the start, it probably would have been Marie Egan and Rose Lorgan. They probably would have been, I suppose, the first trainers I would have had um, for ladies football underage. They probably would have been kind of the grassroots where it all started um, properly um, with the training sessions and the skills and all that kind of thing. And it just kind of went from there. Um, And I guess going back to even younger age, like pre that, I suppose like three, four or five probably would have been my brother. Um, Because one of my earliest memories is actually of him trying to teach me how to solo a ball around um, the red washing basket that mom actually still has to this day. He used to put it out on the lawn and he used to give me the ball and he's like run around there and solo and come back and hand pass back to me. So um that's probably where it started really. Um and then gradually my sister became involved and she wasn't very good at that age. She was very uncoordinated, but um I had a target to kick to. I hadn't anyone to catch it, but she she was a target to kick to. So she eventually got better as as she got older. So eventually I had someone kicking it back to me and um when she when she didn't put her hands up in front of her face to block the ball in there, so <laughs> that's um, brilliant, yeah. And the yeah. Uh, the red washer basket is still on the go, is it? It's still on the go, believe it or not. Now it's 
it's well worn out at this stage, <laughs> but it's it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> that's deadly yeah uh, do you remember uh, having much of a rivalry with the likes of uh, Milton Malby or Quilty or any of them in the in the early days or yeah we we always had it would have been more Milton because I, I don't think Kilmary Brickin actually had, uh, had many women's teams at that stage I don't mm. think so Milton would have always been underage they would have been one of the top teams um, yeah. because when I was growing up um, it was between them Cora Clare Fergus Rovers were kind of the kingpins of ladies football at, at senior level so Milton always had like a good solid team um, and I remember oh we used to get to finals and you used to be playing against Milton and you just know straight away that you hadn't really much hope <laughs> playing against them because they were always so strong and they always just seemed so much taller and bigger than the rest of us. We were just tiny little tots coming from Killingham and we we could just never compete at their level. But um yeah, like they we formed a great rivalry with them. And it was never never a bitter one at that at that. But yeah. um we eventually got the upper hand of them. It took it took many years <laughs> later before it happened, but Eventually, we we managed to um, get on top, at top yeah. level. And uh, when you get on to the the county, then how did the how did the change from the county or, or to the the West Clare Waves in the 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 AFL then part of uh, of life? How did that come about? Yeah, so that was actually very random. Um, how it all happened because um, it's actually Rosie Cran who plays with us on on the Kilmahal team. Um, her brother is huge into AFL and would be like one of the major people in AFL Ireland and would have set it up for the women's side of things and himself and his brother um, the two of them Mike and Brian would have like set up AFL Ireland and and they Mike just wanted to get a women's comp run up and running and um, Rosie kind of just dragged a few of us along um, and we were just lucky with the timing of the season it was um, we were just finished we were probably knocked out of everything at that stage I think it was October or November and you know you know yourself they can be pretty miserable months yeah. um, as it is and not much on and you're, you know you don't have much of a break from the GA season but something different came up and we were like sure look we're doing nothing else anyway might as well <laughs> go have a bit of crack and and see what it's like and I think instantly the we we all like pretty much fell in love with the game straight away all of the girls that went up and we we actually ended up being, been pretty good and we won out the tournament um as it came so um I think even just that win and feeling was nice to get because yeah. we had, you know, come off the back of a couple of losses between with Claire and with Kilmahull and stuff. So I think even just the feeling of winning something was was a nice change for us all and, you know, something different, something new for and a different focus away from football. So we kind of went from there and the team got better and better and we started recruiting a few more. They started coming because <laughs> they saw how much fun we were having. Yeah. And that kind of led to the European stuff and how we ended up in Amsterdam and winning the Champions League out there yeah. and then later on they're winning then with um, winning the European Cup with Ireland so mm. it kind of all just it stemmed from that day in um, in Dublin where we went up in the freezing cold <laughs> and played um, a tournament against a couple of teams that had you know a bit of experience with yeah. the AFL and you know had played a little bit maybe in Australia and had come home and stuff and um, so like it was yeah, it was definitely a breath of fresh air and probably something that I needed at that stage to, yeah. you know, change things up a little bit from the same old, same old. Yeah. And what was the, did you find the setup like the Irish Banshees team, you know, a step up again from the West Fair Waves or? Oh, was yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, it was in fairness, um, especially um, because most of the girls had actually like played some of the tournaments at that stage um, because it had been a year later pretty much when we played. Um in the Europeans um, with the Irish squad. So a lot of the girls would have had a bit more experience under their belt. And, you know, a lot of the girls would have been county girls as well. And, mm. you know, fringe county players. So yeah. um, the standard is actually quite high with, with within the squad. And I think the style of play that we have, having the Gaelic football background, you know, really stood to us against mm. all of the other countries because they would yeah. have gone out to try and play Aussie rules, like how it's yeah. played, whereas we were playing Aussie rules with, a bit of a football flair so yeah. it kind of it made our games all very different and very hard to play against so um yeah definitely another step up again which was yeah. which was good and then uh then the ultimate step up to uh to, Austra <laughs> to australia then uh, yeah I, I had a uh, chrissy mckaig was on with me um the other week he was uh, I was a former sydney swan himself and uh, he was saying that mm -hmm. out there it's it's all 
the GA is essentially all professional and all but money. Do you find the same kind of attitude out there with the Crows? Yeah, like it's mm. um, like it's like you were talking about step ups there, and mm. it's like the step up isn't even on the same staircase. Right. Like when you're <laughs> when you're thinking about it, like in terms yeah. of you know the level that you go to when you come out and play FLW when you've played for um, Western Wales and Banshees. Like mm. while it was an absolutely brilliant starting point, and you know, gave me a feel for the ball, a feel for the game, and you know the pretty basic stuff like when once you get out there like they're absolutely they're so elite in in how they train and and their knowledge of the game because even though a lot of the girls wouldn't have played it from a very young age um or played it consistently um throughout their careers they would have still grown up with the game and they yeah. would have watched it on tv and they would have been supporters of the game so having that base knowledge is you know that's years of knowledge that they have on all of us getting footballers coming out to the game and and then just I suppose that extra couple of years of been in the professional system um, of, you know, even the SNC side and the, the skills and the coaching and, you know, the professional side of things where, you know, it's really focusing on the players individually rather than just a collective um, approach, which ten- generally t- tends to be the, the GA approach for especially the women's side of things anyway back home. So, yeah, just that, that next level um, professionalism and, you know, you have your individualized programming, you have your, like individualized skill things that you need to work on. It's just, it's just absolutely next level. And then like when you, when you actually stop and think about it, like you're getting paid to kick a baller and it's, <laughs> and as, as, as a female, like that was, I never thought that that day would come, especially for me, you know, mm. especially when your sport is getting football and there's no hope of that becoming a professional mm. anytime soon. So it just never seemed feasible for me to, to reach um, a professional side of sport, but, I guess this was the opportunity. Yeah. While it may not be getting football, it's the closest thing you'll probably yeah. get to it. Yeah, I'd say the I'd say the lads at Kilmehill though are probably going. Well, we made her professional now. She can take all her <laughs> the condition that she wants. We made we made her who she is. So. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll take a lot of credit. In fairness, they they do deserve a lot of credit because yeah. w- without the without the club and without that start, and without Gaelic football and and every everything um based in Kilmehill, like I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am today. So it yeah. is hugely grateful for for where I grew up and that football was my first love yeah and when the debut came against the the Western Bulldogs was it a case of Mm. "Ah, this is class or I'm shitting myself (laughs) no I was actually the week leading up to it was the the part where I was dreading the most and that was because of selection week Um, yeah okay I I was so nervous coming up to it because like I felt like I had you know, I'd done as much as I could, but I still didn't know if it was enough and I didn't know if I'd be in. And to be honest, going out there in the first season, I didn't expect to get a single game. Um, So like the pressure point was actually waiting for selection and waiting for that day to come and to hear whether or not you're in or out of the squad. And then once that came, pressure just disappeared. It was the strangest feeling um, that going out to play my first AFLW game, I felt no pressure whatsoever. That it had just gone once... I heard my name being called out on the squad and I was making my first appearance for the club. Mm. It was just, yeah, it was, it was a great experience to be honest. And um, I guess I just took it with open arms and absolutely embraced the opportunity that I was given because I, I knew that I was extremely fortunate and then, and getting my name up in that wall as been an Adelaide Crows player was something that from day one, when I walked into the club, when I got signed, um, back in August um, or September in 2018 it was just like wow I just want to get my name on that wall and then once I knew I was in that squad my name was going to be on that wall so it was just yeah probably just a big relief um, and yeah and I was just able to go out and enjoy the game and enjoy the experience which I did immensely and it, when, obviously we were unfortunate not to yeah. win that game We I think we couldn't kick straight <laughs> today <laughs> but but just to be a part of it was absolutely, you know, it was crazy. It was it was such a special moment and it's one that I'll definitely cherish for the rest of my life, even though Sadly. we obviously had bigger days yeah. that led after that. But that, that first day, you know, running out into the over was, was pretty special. Yeah. And uh, I suppose we're big, big stuff that's happened here in the last few weeks. We're fortunate now that TG Cahar have, uh, have started showing the highlights over here, even though, Few of us have the channels and stuff. It's just time wise, it maybe doesn't work, <laughs> doesn't work out that well. Um, yeah. Other than yourself and your partner Anne and Sarah Allen, who who should we be keeping an eye out for in the in the coming seasons? 
um in the crows team um yeah jesus it's, it's hard to look past um it's hard to look at, past Erin and, and the week that she's had she Erin yeah. phillips she had um, an incredible game at the weekend kicking four goals and i think it was something like 19 or 20 disposals which mm. is absolutely crazy like she's she's playing some really good football at the moment and it's really exciting to see that she's you know she's back to her best and you know she's really leading from from her actions on the field so it's um she's such an exciting player to to play with and to watch and you know you're just in awe of her anytime you step on the field with her because she's just so so tuned into the game and she's just you know extremely talented and skillful so you definitely can't look look past her and and obviously having Chelsea back on the field as well um our captain Chelsea Ren she yeah. was she missed um last season through injury and you know it was was a big loss to us you know even just her presence alone because she's such a great leader um and like she's such a courageous player on the field as well so you'll you'll see her but she's she'll generally spend most of her time in the air flying <laughs> trying to catch balls than she will on the ground she's just one of those players that you'll always see her up yeah. in the air trying to trying to catch a mark probably 10 meters ahead of her she'll you know she'll always be flying in the air to to get that ball oh, deadly yeah to keep an eye out is there a is there a difference in the buzz you get say from kicking scores for Kilmehill? Versus kicking, you know, kicking, <laughs> kicking lumps out of Carlton in in the twenty nineteen final. Is is there a difference in the buzz or? Uh, there's there's definitely a difference. Uh, it seems to happen a bit more with Kilmehill than I score, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it just it doesn't happen quite as much, unfortunately, with, with the AFL. But um, obviously, I, when when you kick the goal, um, the celebrations are you know the game stops and it's big celebration. Yeah. So that was a big change, even. For me, I remember kicking my first goal against Melbourne Demons um, at Casey Fields in my first season and I kicked the goal and I actually wasn't sure what to do. I thought I'd made a mistake <laughs> because it was just like, there was a pause and I didn't know how, like, was I supposed yeah. to celebrate or what the hell? Like, it was actually, I was like, oh my God, someone please tell me I've done the right thing or this counts as a goal or something. And then eventually Sophie Lee ran over to me and gave me a big hug so I knew I had done the right thing. So yeah. it was just a strange experience to actually... Um, kick a goal and then obviously you kind of embrace it then once you've once you've got through the hurdle of the first one and you yeah. kind of you embrace the girls coming around you and you know the celebrations and the high fives and everything that goes with it so and obviously kicking one in, in a grand final in front of 53,000 people that's yeah. that's obviously something you know I'll, I'll never forget like Jesus seeing a full stadium um was incredible so um it's yeah, definitely one for the books. <laughs> yeah, and you uh, is am I right in saying you came back for for the commute in some ways to win the twenty nineteen <laughs> senior championship with Kilmehill? Yeah, back back for the commute. That's a good way of. <laughs> yeah, because because when I was chatting to um, the two, I was chatting to the two mead lads, uh, Mickey Burke and Sean Tobin, the other day, and Sean told me a story of mm-hmm. how he was on holidays in Vietnam and flew back for a club final and then flew back out to Vietnam. But he said sure he was on the pitch for his for his club and sure he was. He he was barely there, like he was so jet lagged. <laughs> was uh, what was it like Jesus. for coming back for Kilmehill? Yeah, um, honestly, we, like we had probably, um, I think we had lost the last four finals, and this was our fifth in a row mm. we were going for, yes. and it was against the same team. Mm. And um, at this stage, we, my first county final was two thousand and nine, and ten years later, we were still trying to win against the same team. It was the mm. same <laughs> battles over and over again. And to be honest, I don't think anyone really thought that we'd get over the line. And I think something just um, clicked in us this in 2019 that we just, a lot of the girls would have had matured and um, just got, you know, that little bit older, a little bit more experience behind them. Like we've always had a, a very skillful team and very good girls playing. We're very extremely young. Like I think mm. we've only like one player in their 30s and the rest mm. are either... Um, like teen, like older teenagers, early twenties, and then there'd be me and a couple of girls around the mid late twenties. So that that'd be it in terms of like the age profile. So an extremely young team, and obviously a big ask to to keep coming back, and yeah. especially after defeat after defeat. And we had lost the previous final by I think twenty points. Oh. So it was a big <laughs> big ask, and yeah. you know not much had changed from their squad, and not much had changed from our squad, other than. Um, I had I suppose a year of professional sport on my belt, yeah. and my sister came back for that season as well. And we had Adele McMahon, who's also an international yeah. rugby, 
rugby players are, had come back for the season as well. So I suppose every little bit helps um, when it gets to that stage. And and I think we just had a, a newfound belief and calmness within us. Normally we'd, we'd be going out to tear the heads off them, but <laughs> we kind of went out with the with the attitude of, you know what, let's just do this for ourselves. Let's just do it for the love of the parish and for ourselves like instead of going out and trying to destroy a team let's just go out and you know do ourselves proud for once and and see what comes out of it and we just we just got it so right on the day and you know what it it took nine years of hardship but <laughs> yeah. um that for that one hour when it when it all clicks and comes together it, like I think we were up by 11 points um at the end when the when the full-time whistle went and we celebrated like we had just won by a point. Like we, we just never let up. We were so like, they're going to come back at us. They're going to come back. We'd have, we can't stop until the whistle is gone, is gone. And like just that relief that we had actually done it. It was like, people ask me like, like what are your highlights in, in your sporting career? And like, it's hard to compare the two in terms of winning the grand final in front of 50,000 and then obviously winning with your club. Like they're, they end up in two different, completely different experiences, but like between the two of them, they're, you know, they are my top two. It's, it's, it's an incredible feeling to actually finally win. And it's something that I thought I'd never win the kind yeah. of championship. Um, the so scouts, yeah. an extremely, extremely special moment that I, you know, I had both of those days in the one year. So, um, yeah, it's funny that you said yeah, was... two, two different experiences. One is in the pissing of the rains in West Clare versus the other out in Australia. <laughs> <as well. laughs> yeah. They're very different. Be different every... right? Yeah. Uh, it's funny you <laughs> mentioned, you mentioned tearing the heads off people, you know, and it's it's funny like a, a village as such, you know, Kilmichel has produced yourself, a professional sports star in Australia, your sister and Adele McMahon, who've both been voted onto the panel of the best Irish rugby team in the past 10 years. So, tearing yeah. the heads off opposition is probably not unusual in some ways <laughs> probably not and there must be something in the water in in, <laughs> in west clare and yeah. Hall, especially for the women's side of things anyway yeah definitely whatever yeah. it is and what was uh when you were back to australia then what was the your two-week quarantine you had to do was it full you know rob carney where you're dressing up in fancy clothes in the hotel you know not stuck in the room with no window open or what was it like Oh, like it was, it was full lockdown and we happened to do it in Perth. So yeah. however strict it would have been in any other state, um, doing it in WA, it was just, it was cruel. Like yeah. we literally were led into the room and no window, couldn't open. Mm. Like we had a window, but we couldn't open it. We didn't have fresh air for, for two weeks. And literally the only time you saw someone was when you opened the door and potentially they opened the door at the same time. Like Cora was across the, the way from me and... Mm if we just happened to open the door for our meal at the same time, that was the only communication we had with wow. the outside world. Um, and like the meals just came at a, at, at a set time every day. Yeah. Like no matter how hungry you were or <laughs> how not hungry you were, you were, they came at the same time and they weren't always the most appetizing meals, but um, we were, we were quite fortunate with the AFL and, and Adelaide Coast had organized some gym equipment to be in the room. Yeah. Like, but it was the least we could have, had because like we were heading straight into a preseason that we'd already missed two months of so mm. um it was just good to have something to top up with um I never really want to see a bike again to be <laughs> honest a stationary bike but, um, yeah. but you, look, didn't, it, you didn't it, go full did. uh you didn't go full Rob Kearney and dress up and he dressed up I was following his Instagram when he was in the quarantine uh, <laughs> full dressing up in suits just to sit on the bed and take photos like it wasn't a you didn't go mental in the end of it did you no, I the last couple of days were tough, fairness, but um, yeah. I just tried to use um the room and equipment as best as possible to try and pass the time. So yeah. I ended up doing a lot of exercise, and I ended up using the mattress as um as a wall to kick a ball against. <laughs> Put that up against the window. If I broke the window, I didn't really care. It was kind of a bonus. Yeah. So I got some fresh air. Um, <laughs> but no, it didn't break the window. But um. Yeah, set up the room in different ways so that I could, you know, kick and do my gym stuff and cycle and run. I I ran a five k within, within the room. Stop. Um, how did that? How yeah, did that go I, up and back? Like, um, up and around the bed and back around. So like a <laughs> kind of like a L. It was an L shaped five k. Wow. It was actually a pretty decent time too. Okay. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's, it was on my Instagram. But um, all right. Yeah, um, that one, yeah. ran ran 5k in the hotel room um 
I just got to a stage where I was like, I just want to run. Like it's been, mm. it had been over. Um, I think at that stage it was, I think about 12 days since I had ran because with the travel and stuff, yeah. I think it was day 10, but with the travel and everything, I was just, and I was just, I was going mad in, in that regard. I was like, I can't get fresh air. At least I can try and run in here. So I went for a run and then I just kept going. I was like, sure, look, I might as well try and get 5K. At least I feel like I've done something. <laughs> whoever's, um, in, whoever's in the room underneath you is like, would she ever stop? Yeah, <laughs> between kicking the ball and running around 5K, I said they were they were going mental at me anyway. But, yeah. And we were right up at the top of the hotel, so <laughs> def- they could definitely hear me. Yeah, um, you sound like you were going to yeah, follow Australian Open tennis, putting the mattress up against the wall. <laughs> yeah i they reckon they got that idea from me they must have seen it okay. on my instagram or something <laughs> definitely you, you can take credit for that <laughs> I, I claim so, yeah, that. yeah I, claim, um, I claim that one yeah uh, since you're mentioning food as well i, I have to ask uh, there's a there's an interesting piece you probably know it i don't know where i found it uh, yourself and some of the girls uh, i think miliana reichich and a few others going around testing out the food mm. in adelaide surely yeah the smashed avocado and all that surely can't compare to a curry chips from Fryer Tucks back home. <laughs> oh Jesus! Um, very hard comparison to make now. It's between <laughs> them now. It's tough. Um, Fryer Tucks was always great after after the matches, and they were our sponsor actually on the yeah, that's right, this year, yeah. which was um or last year. So like, yeah, um. Yeah, tough comparison, but unfortunately, fire talks aren't open for breakfast, so <laughs> I'll have to go with this smashed avocado for, for yeah, breakfast. Yeah, fair um, enough. <laughs> That's the way it goes, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, yeah. two thousand eight, uh, you went, uh, you went the whole way in the intermediate. Um, but the question back back home, I should say, the question uh, is more: you scored eight twenty one in the championship, and you were scored eight sixteen. Do you think? Is there a bit of bitterness still in her from that that she didn't outscore you, or how would she feel about? I actually about? didn't even realize that. Yeah. Um. Geez, I didn't even realize. I must. Uh, I must. Um. Tell that to her now because I don't. You, you she scored never mentioned six, that to me. Sixteen thirty-seven between you in the championship, which isn't bad going um, in fairness. But you did outscore her by five points, which I'm sure is niggling at her a little bit deep down. If you ask yeah, her. probably, probably, yeah, probably a little bit to be honest, but. I suppose the most important thing is that we actually did win the club on Ireland. Yeah. Um, um, and actually, you know, that was, I guess we were probably a little bit young to really appreciate that mm. at the time. Um, but like, it was a great achievement for the parish. And I remember even the celebrations, like the whole village came out and we were up in a lorry and we were driving <laughs> around the village beeping and everything. Like it was, yeah. it was crazy times, but um, probably like looking back, we were just so young we didn't really appreciate it we thought that this would happen more often that we would have days like that and little did we know it would take 11 years later before we'd win and you know another Mm. um trophy like a a championship trophy for the club so Mm. um yeah it was it was a great day and it was a great great um day for the parish as well and to be part of all that those celebrations it was We've had we haven't had too many wins, but when we have won them, they've been really big days. So yeah, I, I have to <laughs> I have that. to say I have to thank the the statsmen, whoever they are down in Clare, who found that stat out <laughs> uh, because that, I I went digging it for a while. Well. I was like, yeah, I was like, I wonder what I find it, and then uh, sure enough, I accidentally came across because uh, I saw the fo- I saw the photo all right of the two of you holding up the cup, and then I went, geez, mm-hmm. I wonder who outscored who. And sure enough, it was the next thing that I found. So fair play to the, the statsmen down in Kilmill, who whoever they are, yeah, who, uh, who, had, well. who had that one up. Yeah, someone was tracking it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, who would be, I suppose, uh, the last few questions, and then there's a little quick fire round if you want to try it as well. Who would be, uh, who yeah. would be the toughest player that you ever marked or came up against in the GAA back home during your time? Could be club Ooh, or county. Though. Um, probably played against quite a few. Um, <clears throat> Jesus. Um, I'd probably have to go county to be honest because yeah. like in, especially in my early days for senior and stuff we would have played against Cork and Dublin and you know some of the really really good teams yeah. and stuff um, actually do you know what my toughest one was probably Maria Curley from Tipperary and that was only in recent years okay. um, I remember we were playing playing a monster final in um, in Mallow it was our first time playing each other in um they had beaten us, I think. They beat us the following few years after that as well. So we didn't have a great record against Tip in most yeah. finals. But um, we're actually great friends, myself and Maria. And okay. we have normally managed to avoid marking each other. But 
on this occasion she was full back I was full forward there was no way of avoiding it but <laughs> she was stuck to me I'd say that my jersey was ripped in four <laughs> different places from her hanging off me and I remember at one stage she was running so close to me that I had to like run towards the ref and veer off the last second and she actually ended up running into the referee <laughs> and I was like I was like I nearly like stopped and pissed myself off and because I was like this is too funny but I actually had to play on because I was actually running for a ball but like I remember it. she was running so close to me and she was focusing on me so much that she actually ran straight into the ref and actually fell over but um, that's, brilliant. that's yeah. how tidy she was marking okay. me she was practically in my shorts she was so tight <laughs> that's brilliant and uh, what about in, in the other code then uh, in Australia who's the toughest you've come up against so far or some of the toughest Ooh. even Probably your, um, probably your teammates in training, I'd say. I thought, in some yeah, cases, yeah, I'd probably say, yeah, my own teammates. So, um, in the tackling drills, um, Ebony Marinoff is just fierce in the tackle. Like, okay. Jesus. And I know her name has gone around a bit back home. Yeah. But, you know, the whole the whole Giants thing and stuff. But, like, in training, like, her tackling is very, very strong. And anytime you see her in a drill, you'll, you'll know that you've been tackled. So, like, to me, it's, it's brilliant. Like, I, I look for it because you know, you want to be getting tackled by one of one of the strongest tacklers in the comp and mm. to get to get used to the game. And if you're going to get the hardest one in training, at least then when you go to a game, you're prepared for it and you're you're able for what's coming. So between herself and Chelsea is Chelsea Randall is just impossible to get around. She's okay. so agile. Um so so agile and like her tackle is fierce as well. She's just one of those players so quick on her feet and you know can catch you no matter what what way you go if you're coming straight at her or if you're coming zigzag she'll get you no matter what she's just one of those really really quick agile players yeah and did, did you find yourself actually well I think of it um i just to kind of cross my mind when I was at the 2010 All-Ireland final um I can't remember was it Marty Clark or someone for down and the same with like even Kieran Kilkenny and those and some of the girls well have come back did you find yourself in 2019 when you kind of came back for a while was there a split second where you went, I can't rugby tackle these to the ground? Or <laughs> do, do you find your kick, you know, your your method of kicking slightly different? Oh, yeah, kick. It was the kick. It wasn't so much the tackle because I think just the years of playing football, yeah. like, that was the natural to go back into that. But oh my God, I remember playing the club game. Um, I'd say probably maybe a week after I came home um, and it was first round championship. And I'd, I swear, I, I single-handedly, I'd say kicked 10 wides in the first half. <laughs> I couldn't right. I couldn't get the I couldn't get the kick right. I found it so hard to come back to the round ball and, and get the kicking technique. Um and like having done both, it's far easier to kick an over the ball straight. Right. Um having done both. Um now it's harder to get the, the different kicks and stuff. And if you mm. miss up the ball drop, it's gonna be a shanked kick. But yeah. in general, it's easier to kick it straight and get it to the target. But the round ball, it's just you just the kick is completely different and it wasn't until coming back that first year that I really realised the difference. But, um, well, I haven't really kicked much around ball since because obviously with COVID and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm thankfully getting the hang of, of the oval ball pretty much <laughs> and can start kicking a bit more Gaelic style, which is exactly what they told me not to do when I first came yeah. out. They were like, kick it straight, <laughs> kick a punt kick. We don't want you kicking around the body, as, <laughs> as they call it. And I'm like, well, that's what I'm comfortable with. So yeah. I'll stick to the punt kick until I get it right. And then when I get that right, then I'll move on to my own style. And uh, to be honest, I've, I've pretty much um, moved on to kicking around the body and kicking outside of the boot, but with an over ball. So yeah, that's it was just de- my style of kick. It was definitely something that you would have noticed. And, you know, people in, particularly in 2010, I think it was Cork versus Down and, uh, Mar- Marty Clark I think was you know and the way he was kind of coming at it sideways but sort of with a, a punted effort and it was kind of putting the ball yeah. down towards his foot as opposed to like you know the kind of outstretched arm looking at your target and yeah people yeah. I remember people around me were kind of like you know there were a few elderly people who clearly didn't know that he had been out in Australia and it was the same <laughs> they were like why is he kicking it like that you know and the same even when you look at like uh, some people who've come back as well there's kind of there's a sideways kick but there's also in some ways the kind of putting the ball down towards the foot as opposed yeah. to yeah yeah did you, did you find that yeah. yourself as well yeah like it was just a very different technique and it, like I guess I didn't notice the difference really until I came back to the round ball like going to switch into the oval I was like yeah this is a little bit weird but mm. like I've done all this style of kick before like I've done the punt kick like I know the but I think having so much repetition of that and just constantly doing that coming back to a round ball again yeah. was like 
oh my god what's happened <laughs> yeah yeah it has had a I suppose it must be I can't imagine what it's like uh, trying to move from one to the other but uh, <laughs> the last question I have then which is the most vital one before the, the quick fire round and uh, it's the most important I've asked everybody which is uh, have you, did you ever win anything in the Kilmehill Club Lotto not a thing no. <laughs> <laughs> personally not a thing I don't even think anyone in my family ever won anything maybe my mother has won 50 or at one stage but I think that is literally about it <laughs> yeah that's good no, uh, no I asked everybody and I had no no and then I got to I had a slight improvement where one of the lads was voted the best seller in his club and then the other night okay. um the other night two of the two of the Calvin Camogie girls came on and two of them had won 40 euro in it which was a which was a, a massive moment yeah in the in the podcast anyway that's, it was a massive a big moment, moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge moment yeah that's so, definitely uh, yeah. yeah um the last part then is just a quick fire round if you're interested in having a go with it it's um because yeah, sure. the po- the pod- it. yeah, the podcast is called The Loaf of Bread after uh, Paddy O'Shea's famous speech to the Westmead boys in 04. So uh, I kept it the team of bread. So the quick fire round is called uh, Cutting Off the Crust because you're a little shy to one <laughs> for your mother. So <laughs> very easy to remember you know yourself. So uh, now you have a choice yeah. as it was the two codes here so you could go with either. So what's the best ground you've ever played on? It could be GA or down under. Uh Oh, it's between Croke Park and Adelaide Oval. Which do I pick? <laughs> oh my God, uh, Croke Park. I'll say Croke Park. Park. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Your le- least favorite ground you've ever played on? Um. Oh, well, there's a few then. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually I don't like um Kilmary Brick and GA pitch. I don't like Quilty GA pitch. I'm gonna say that. Okay, good stuff. Uh, are you more the short kick or drive it long? Uh, long. Long. Uh, yeah. As as a supporter at a game, would you be more the the tea and ham sandwiches out of the boot of the car or the pub beforehand? Tea and ham sandwiches. Okay. Yeah. Stuff. The ham uh, sandwiches. Yeah. Uh, you have a choice of one here: the famous GA one, the hats, flags, scarves, or headbands. Um, headbands. Headbands. Uh, Marty Morrissey or Des Cahill? Marty Morrissey, because he's a clear man. As a clear man, I knew you got that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you have a good few choices here. So yourself, who's your favorite pundit, male or female, on TV in any sport? Ooh, any sport. Yeah. Uh, I'd say my sister now would kill me if I didn't say her on <laughs> TG Carr. So yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I was like, there's a long pause here, and Eber, Eber is just going. Would she ever pick me for fuck's sake? Yeah, yeah, no, I'll yeah. go Eber TG Carr. Okay, good stuff. Um, What's the next one? Uh, the funniest or strangest thing that's ever been shouted at you from the sideline by anybody? Um, a lot of the lads and girls I've had so far said, I can't repeat some of the things that have been said. So Yeah, that's it's probably fair to, to yeah. a lot of things that have been said. Um, uh, Jesus. I know this isn't very quick. I'm not getting <laughs> no, this. No, you're, you're grand. It's fine. It's quick fire, but realistically, um, it's it's the thinking round. <laughs> <laughs> it's just enough to think about it. Um, yeah. I'm sure someone has said go home. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I've, I've, had that, I've had that one a few times. Yeah, you can go with that yeah. one if you want to. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that one. That's, that's been a common one. Um, I suppose I could ask you two versions of this question, but uh, if there was a GA transfer market in the morning, who would you buy in for Claire? If you had to buy in one player. Uh, if you buy in one player. Um, Fiona McHale from Mayo. Okay. Good stuff, yeah. And uh, mm. I suppose I could ask you the same one for... For the crows, if you had a choice of buying him one, you can replace. Um, you can replace Anne. Anne can be thrown out, and you can. <laughs> else, so. Um, who would I pick? Um, Jesus. Well, I'll probably pick Maddie Press Parkers because she is the AFL best and yeah. first of last season. So you might as well okay. take her in. Yeah. she's the best. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, your favorite boots? Adidas Predators. Yeah, that's going a lot, all right, yeah. Uh, studs, or mo- <laughs> studs or moles? Moles. Moles. Too hard for studs here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Um, I'll ask you this one, I suppose, as a GA, because it's not too applicable to the AFL. Mm. Uh, sweeper or no sweeper? Or how many sweepers? <laughs> oh, one sweeper. One sweeper, one okay, sweeper. good stuff. Yeah. Um, your favourite sport outside of the GA and the AFL? Um, your sister's going pick rugby you little shit rugby or... yeah rugby <laughs> yeah I, I can hear her just going we'll see, pick we'll rugby, rugby and yeah. support the family yeah um, I suppose Australia doesn't count for this one but what's the best holiday you've ever been on New York 
New York, okay. And uh, last yeah, question to finish. Well, last two questions of us together. Uh, the best GA player ever in your lifetime? Of course, Staunton. Oh, brilliant. Okay. And uh, the best AFL player that you've come across out there? Aaron Phillips. Aaron Phillips. Okay. Good shows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron Phillips. That's deadly. Yeah. Ailish, look, uh, I won't take up, I was going to say take up your morning. It's morning here, but nighttime out there. I won't take <laughs> up, uh, I won't take up any more of your night, but just say uh, a huge thanks for coming to the podcast. I've had a, I've had the crack chat and tea. It's been brilliant. And uh, sorry, I came dressed as an Adelaide crow, but uh, I couldn't, I couldn't. No, resist don't ever apologize for that. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. I couldn't resist having the gear here. So uh, yeah, look, the best, the best of luck in uh in all the games coming up and uh, hopefully you might see you back in uh, in a Kilmehill jersey at some stage uh, yourself and yeah, and, you and Deemer and uh, Andy Dell as well you as know. it was the, the three of you left to line yeah. up so yeah um, but look the best of luck and uh, have a good uh, have a good night's sleep out there I suppose while I'm getting up I will <laughs> yeah thanks a million Ailish appreciate it <laughs> no worries yeah thanks mind yourself much. take it I'll easy you soon. yeah take it you easy too. good luck bye bye see you later see bye. you later Coming up next week on the Loaf of Bread GA podcast, we cut into our next slice. Coming up next week on Slice 9, I have the chats with a young Kerry man who is no doubt set to become another famous name in the Kerry defence. Uh, my year minor, I was managed by Peter Key and I thought just, Joy, he's a weird man in, in the sense he could be very serious and then five seconds later he could be <laughs> pulling the, 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 the mickey out here. Yeah. Uh, but I thought uh, just... The way he approached the game, you know, it was always he was always there as a friend more as a manager. I think he's a, a very approachable kind of manager, uh, someone I always kind of liked. And then I chat with Kerry All Ireland minor winning defender Owen Fitzgerald from Guinea We chat growing up in the famed Schlieve Lucre region, following in the big footsteps of Kerry Greats, local hero Ambrose O'Donovan, being an all star fullback, bringing the cup to schools, studying, the celebrations, and much more. Don't miss it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Loaf of Bread GAA podcast. Slicing into the GAA. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Anchor and Pocket Casts. On Instagram at Loaf of Bread GAA pod. On Twitter at Loaf Pod. And on email loafofbreadpod at gmail.com. For any questions, queries, comments, feedback or if you're interested in coming on yourself. Sloan again.